Hello, welcome to the latest episode of Through the Pages. Thank you for checking out my YouTube channel. If this is your first time here, I got plenty more videos coming. Um, read a wide array of books, some science -y, some novels, some old, some new. So thank you for checking this out. Um, if you end up enjoying the video, a little thumbs up would be awesome. And this isn't even so much for the YouTube metrics. This is just, it's just neat to know someone out there is watching and saying like, I like that, Joe. Um, so, yeah, want to do a subscribe? You want to keep up with this? Um, usually do about maybe five or six book reviews a month. Um, and today we're reading a book from last year, Listening to Ecstasy by Charles Winninger. So, Charles is a psychoanalyst, um, so he's been dealing in emotions for decades, and unlike a lot of psychedelic books coming out these days, this is not narrowed in on the uh, like the forefront of the clinical research, I would say. Um, while it is in a medical context, it's not it's not just all about like where it's at for PTSD, legalization, decriminalization. It's not kind of right there. It's more um, his experience with it later in life, which I think gives a very seasoned and mature look to it where sometimes it can be difficult for someone who maybe say looks like me um long-haired younger dude saying like dude ecstasy it helped like so i think it's really nice to hear from him not only the benefit that it brought him but his wife too um so a little background on the or kind of summation of the book without it's not really a book to give spoilers on um but so basically he kind of found his soulmate later in life which is always an inspiring story my godmother is that way and i i am i I'm, I'm so thankful to know someone <laughs> is that way um because it's the strongest relationship I, I know and so this is very much the same way where they had this kind of the parallel late in life insecurities and connected he was unsure if he could um, express his proclivity for psychedelics or as people call it a psychonaut and on a date she said if she really wanted to try MDMA it's like boom like this is this is soulmate stuff and their experience with it and tapping into the scene and everything at that age and the joy that it brought them not stimulation but joy like deep harmony that's something that i think is lost a little bit in contemporary psychedelic literature i think psychedelics can be important for making a well person feel better and much like with cannabis we kind of have to start it you know there's cancer patients there's ptsd and start there and 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 give these bona fide medical uses never had to do that with alcohol you know we didn't have to show that whiskey had medical value we just had to say we like this we're grown adults you know regulate it we want the the impurities out of it i want to know the potency and then i'm going to do it responsibly so i think literature like this really helps the case that it to to say it's pure recreation is also is almost demeaning but to have to label everything under the gauze of medical is constrictive and almost means that you had to be in a low place to be able to access it. And I don't think that's how it should be. I think we always have the right to bolster our own consciousness, whether that's through meditation or fasting or, or a, a substance. Um, and he does a really good job of explaining the responsible use that he he's taken the the kind of approach that he's found and how that can be easily kind of fettered out to to people and i will say mdma is one of my favorite drugs um i've been using it for just over a decade um in the past i was very much more like anytime i'll do it um now i space it out um, and this was prior to reading this and it was kind of a confirmation back, but, um, 
all goes back to Alexander Shulgun, pretty much just saying like about three to four times a year is about the max, though I'm not sure how rigorously he clung to that, and then also don't know if he considered, because he used to say it was his zero calorie cocktail and would be at like cocktail parties and would like dip little, doop, little, little capsules in there, um, because he liked the taste of it, like me, weirdo, but, um, so, but I consider like a, a night of like doing it like, bam, like, I, like, full, full dose, there might be those occasional like concert, like, oh, someone has a little like, eh. like, but I think it's a drug that when done responsibly can be incredible, and I think when done irresponsibly can be depleting, and to better understand the line between that we need experience from people who are or are administering it to themselves or to others responsibly and so this is a it's a great book of responsible use i think we need more of that that it doesn't have to be like i said you know that you have this like severe condition that allows you access to this nice drug and he he does a really good explanation of it in the practical and the emotional sense. Um, I, I just really enjoyed kind of the, the, the beauty that he and his partner found in it and were able to share. And I, I definitely took note of the, the community aspect of it, that there are, like I'm going to a party, birthday party for a friend tonight. And Without knowing who's going to be there, I'd say probably a third of them have done MDMA and probably another third of that third have explored it further, like in wanting to, you know, do it in a, a more holistic sense. But I think you start to find that community and you can explore yourself a little bit more in connection with others because there's that support system, even just like decompressing or expressing and... and I think it's important to have that and he he speaks to coming out of the the closet a lot in this and it's something that I am I would like to think I'm pretty out of the closet but I also know with my day job like which I'm leaving at the end of the year um, uh, I will be much more forward on all social media and just like in, in social circles about use um, though obviously to tread lightly legalities and stuff, but I think he makes it seem like it can be a practical part of society in a way that is lost in other psychedelic literature. And I really, really enjoyed his his thoughtfulness of the substance and then also the the laid back aspect of it too. Like, yeah, I'm going to a rave tonight, I'm gonna take this, it's gonna make the music better. Like there's just straight up like, this is fun. And life's supposed to be fun. But then also recognizing that that fun is different than I had fun playing a board game. Like, there's there's stuff happening that is beneficial. And when you tee yourself up in the right set and setting and let that stuff unfold, when you come back, even if you have a low day or two, ultimately that baseline is higher now. Your, your average kind of where your day-to-day -day is, I find happiness-wise has elevated. And that's, that's true with any psychedelic or, or entheogen, because I would not consider MDMA a psychedelic, but I really liked his, his vantage point on this. And it's a very, I don't say easy book to get through, because that, that makes it seem like it's simplistic, but like, it's, it's about 200 pages, um, and it's, it's a very personal book, so it's not like, like I said, of like clinical ones where it's like, oh man, just study after study. Like, it recognizes that, you know, the work of Rick Doblin, of course, and, and all the others that are, are really like, like pushing forward in the formal ways to broaden access. But it's also just one man's story, and all his wife's story in there as well. But yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this book. He... He's a man I would love to talk with, like just like have tea with and just talk with. Um, obviously, a psychoanalyst, like he he should have that sort of welcoming, almost paternal energy. Um, and it really comes across. It, it's a it's a delicate book um, because it's a delicate subject. But 
it also takes some of that edge off of it. Like it, it there should be a point where it's, it's, it's that fluid in society. And I think that it's, he recognizes, you know, like it, you have to be secretive about it in some degrees. You got to be smart about where you get it or like even writing a book about it. But like, yeah, it, I don't use alcohol anymore. And the, the further away from it I get, the more extreme it feels to me. Like I was at a small concert last night out, out on the riverfront and ran into a friend who was pretty, pretty intoxicated and it's jarring almost. Like I don't like to see friends like that. Um, and we all do it for whatever purposes, but like when I see a friend who's on a lot of ecstasy, like that's just nice. Like, <laughs> like it's, it's, you can express everything. And I think especially for men, MDMA is key in allowing us to not only tap into our emotions, but get them out. And I years ago kind of switched my way of living of I, I was a very contained emotionally person because I felt like what I had going on was too heavy to put out to my guy friends pretty much and now I know where to put it I know some friends I'm not just gonna like unload or like I might ask ahead of time like hey do you have a little extra emotional capacity today you know um, but I think drugs like MDMA psychedelics even cannabis allow me to tap into my emotions more and I think most men would benefit from that in in a, a very true sense so I think this book listening to ecstasy is stellar um, I, I really think I, I, I wish more people would read things like this and I think we all have our certain notions of substances, oftentimes not because we're really familiar with people who use it responsibly, but because of media or past instances or, or, or parties and stuff where we just need to look at the substance. You know, um, it's like I spoke to in, um, book review of this one by Carl Hart. We can demonize the way these substances is, are in society, but if it's that substance with something put in it, um, like like cocaine with levamisole or, or heroin with other adulterants in it, then we're not giving a true analysis of the substance. We're saying, yeah, that dirty version causes problems. I don't like problems. Well, what if it were pure? And this is getting back to that like idyllic, you know, discussing MDMA, not ecstasy pills all over. Like, no, just MDMA, pure, good stuff. And so I think that's kind of where the discussion needs to be, much like with, like, the vegan animal food debate. Like, you see vegans smashing factory farming and pointing fingers at that, much like plant or carnivore people will look at the Impossible Burger and say, that list of ingredients is crazy compared to my grass-fed. It's like, well, you're looking at the worst and comparing it to the best. And the, So it's organic whole foods on both, you know? fair comparison rule out all the process junk no one is advocating for that so when we recognize in drugs it's the same way no one's ad advocating for adultered powders no one wants that like if they were all pure that's the discussion to have and so we got there with alcohol we used to have bathtub gin now we don't i think mdma can have a similar trajectory it's going to have to go through the same rigors that cannabis did of being vetted for medical first and then more people um accepting it and not being so off put when they hear it and I think this book is a major way of moving the ball forward and so highly recommend listening to XC Charles Winnier um just a top-notch book yeah if you enjoyed this if you want more books related to this subject say you're curious about drugs you like learning about them through my videos let me know in the comments. I would be very curious. And if there's any drug-related books that you've been curious about, I will happily read and review them for you. Um, thank you for liking and subscribing. It really does mean a lot to me personally.